morning, good morning. Welcome, everybody. We're here again. 20 of 31 days in the book of Ezekiel. That's right. Come on, join in. Lady Apostle, prophetically speaking. His word in his presence and his power for divine nation. Welcome you. God that you're here. God bless you and welcome. That's right. We're here again, you guys. Day 20th, 31 day in the book of Ezekiel. Lady Apostle. That's right. We're in chapters 22, 23. He's speaking God's word and his presence and power and prayer for a divine nation. Build to Redeem Radio TV Broadcasting. That's to you. Chapter 22 and 23 in the book. May God bless you. And we're going to get started here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
good morning. Welcome. Day 20 of 31 days in the book of Ezekiel with Lady Apostle. We're in chapters 22 and 23. Prophetically speaking in God's word and his presence is power and prayer for divine nation. That's right. Thank you. So are we built to redeem radio, TV, satellite broadcasting services, satellite casting all over the world. 257 countries is hearing God's word, including you. On our social platform here on Facebook Live and other social media platforms. May God bless you. Covering 30, we're covering two chapters per day. Make sure that we finish out by July the 31st. Since there's 47 books in the book, may God bless you, and we're glad that you're here. Thank you. Remember, we can't obey God until we first listen to it. Here today to hear the word of God. That's right. In the book, yet we're here to listen to God's word. We're gonna to listen to a sound word through the word of God. As we study together, so make sure you grab your Bibles and your journals and your pens and paper so that you can take some notes so afterwards you can go back and read and study and show your own sales approved God that we're going to study together and the other passages of scriptures that parallel with this word. I'm so excited that you're here. So go ahead and take a couple minutes out so that we can get to the God and we should have our reader to read us the God. Chapters 22 and 23. Again, we thank you and we're glad that you're here. May God bless you. We thank God for the woman of God. God bless Lady Apostle on this morning. Hallelujah. His faithfulness is our shield. Wrap Psalms 91 around us as we walk, wrap Psalms 91 around the woman of God as she come forth and teach us in the word of God. May the blood of Jesus cover her. May the Holy Ghost speak her. May she be that he may increase that the word of God can fall on good ears. That the hearts will be open to this word and we cast away and block and move out every hard and stony heart. We ask God to open up every blind eye and open up every deaf ear. Thus says the Lord. God for Lady Apostle Robin, who's going to be leading us in these studies these next 20, 11 days. That's right. We're in day 20. 11 more days. We've been God and has been prophetically speaking God's word in his presence and power in prayer for a divine nation. God bless you. And we're going to begin shortly.
you. Glad that you're here. Glory to God, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to go ahead and start. But what I want to do first is I definitely want to take us to a view of where we've been. Because I know a lot of you have just now started with us. So I want to take you. Uh, we're just going to um, give a review on where we've been. Um, starting in, because um, we started in chapter... 15 our way up to 22. So I just kind of briefly just want to just give you, let's start with 12. Let's just talk about a couple of things that we've been talking about. Hallelujah. Amen. So that we can be caught up. Amen. We thank everybody for joining us again. I am Lady Apostle Robin and we're here Day 20 in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 22 and 23. That's right. 31 days in the book of Ezekiel, prophetically speaking in God's word and his presence and power and prayer for a divine nation. So as we just go back and just touch a little bit in the chapter, starting with chapter 12, we uh, pretty much reviewed, talked about the different symbolic acts and also um, related speeches that Ezekiel had to give. And then we begin to talk about the false proverbs and the false prophets and prophets that begin to come into the nation and begin to try to mislead God's people and telling them that the wrath and indignation of God would not happen to them. But that was a lie. So there were consequences for their idolatry. There were consequences for their sin and their iniquity that God's anger and wrath would be upon them. And then we begin to talk about the parable of the vine as well as Jerusalem as a child and a harlot. And then we went on down to chapter 17 talking about the parable of the two eagles. And then we also reviewed individual responsibility, meaning personal accountability that each one had for themselves. They couldn't go around and blame the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, or the apostles saying that they was listening to them. But God said that everybody had their own personal responsibility to know the word. So they could not blame it on hearing the word from someone else. That's why we have to study the word for ourselves and get into the word of God. Because at the end of the day, God holds each and every last of us responsible for our own personal accountability to his word. And then we begin to talk about Babylon God's sword last week, as well as the nation's history in the future. So on today, we're going to talk about the sins of Jerusalem and the parable at two led sisters. Amen. So let's go ahead and begin because I believe that these two chapters is going to be a little bit in debt because I want to make sure that I hit on some good points for you to have an understanding of God's word so that we would not be lost nowhere. Um, so let's go ahead and allow our reader to come on and begin to read the word of God. So for those who have just joined us, we're in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, and we're going to be um, in chapter 23 as well. 
So we're going to go ahead and let our reader read for us this morning. Amen and glory to God. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead and begin um, to read. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now, thou son of man, wilt thou judge, wilt thou judge the bloody city? Yea, thou shalt show her all her abominations. Then say thou, Thus saith the Lord God, The city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come, and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. Thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed and hast defiled thyself in thine idols which thou hast made. And thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and art come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. Those that be near, and those that be far from thee, shall mock thee, which art infamous, and much vexed. Behold, the princes of Israel, Every one were in thee to their power to shed blood. In thee have they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised mine holy things, and hast profaned my sabbaths. In thee are men that carry tales to shed blood. And in thee they eat upon the mountains. In the midst of thee they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife. And another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law. And another in thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. In thee have they taken gifts to shed. Thou hast taken usury and increased. Thou hast greedily gained thy neighbors by extortion and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. Behold, therefore I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made, and at thy blood which hath been in the midst of thee. Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen, and disperse thee in the countries, and will consume my thy filthiness out of thee. And thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came unto thee, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. For they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace, to blow the fire upon it to melt it, so will I gather you in my anger and in my fury. And I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you with the fire of my wrath. And ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure of precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law, and profaned my holy things. They put no difference between the holy and the profane, neither have they shown difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my sons, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have dogged them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity, and abiding lies unto them, saying, 
And I said, say to the Lord God, what the Lord hath not spoken. Ezekiel 23. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, We're in chapter 23. What we're doing is we're going to read both chapters. We're going to go through the study of the book of Ezekiel 22 and 23. Both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. 
I will do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen, and because thou art polluted with their idols. Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup deep and large. Thou shalt be lapped to scorn and had in derision. It containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, and thou shalt break the shirts thereof, and pluck off thy own breasts. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast forgotten me, and cast me behind thy back, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredom. What said moreover unto me, son of man, wilt thou judge Abullah and Aholibah, yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery, and blows in their hands, and with their idols have they committed adultery, and have also caused to their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came at the same day to my sanctuary to profane it and learn. Thus have they done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent the men to come from Don, unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came. Whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thine eyes, and didst thyself with ornaments, and saddest upon a stately bed, and a table prepared before it. For upon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil, and a voice of the multitude being at ease was with her, and with the men of the common sort who were brought Sabaeans from the wilderness which put bracelets upon their hands, and beautiful crowns upon their heads. Then said I unto her that was old in adulteries, for they held in accordance with her, and she with them. And they went in unto her, as they go into a woman that playeth a harpist, so went they in unto a holler, and unto a holy man, the blue women. And the righteous men, they shall judge them after the manner of adulteresses, and after the manner of women, that shed blood, because they are adulteresses, and blood is in their hands. But I say the Lord God, I will bring up a company upon them, and will give them to be removed and spoiled. And the company shall stone them with stones, and dispatch them with their swords. They shall slay their sons and their daughters, and burn up their houses with fire. Thus will I cause lewdness to cease out of the land, that all women may be taught not to do after your lewdness. And they shall recompense your lewdness upon you, and ye shall bear the sins of your idols, and ye shall know that I am. Hallelujah. You shall know that I am the Lord God. He always ends in that. Amen. That is the reading of the word in Ezekiel chapter 22 and 23. So in the chapter 23, we understand that Jehovah calls upon Ezekiel to expose all of Judah's sin. You know, one thing about God is he don't expose just a little bit, but he will expose the whole thing. That's why we don't have to fight against our enemies or fight against anything because God Almighty, Jehovah, will expose it. Amen. So Ezekiel was to expose their idolatry, murder, profaning the Sabbath. Lowness, adultery, their greed, dishonoring gain, and just being disobedient to God. There was so much sin that Ezekiel had to expose. See, God's people are pictured as the dross. Hallelujah. And that's what we're going to talk about on this morning in, the, in, in, in chapter 22. Starting off, we're going to just study 22 and then we'll go into 23. Amen. I just wanted to make sure that we had the reading of the word before us. Amen. But I like how this passage of scripture started off. It says, Moreover, the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, And thou, son of man, wilt thou judge, wilt thou judge the bloody city? Meaning that, hey, you're about to expose them. And I need for you to speak what thus says the Lord. 
So remember when we studied in the book of Ezekiel chapter 21, it began to talk about the judgment of Judah. Whereas now we're in chapter 22, it gives us the occasion for the judgment made. So Ezekiel is told to expose the sins of Judah. See, Judah's citizens were guilty of murder. They were guilty of lewdness and being defiled by idol worship and other sins that I just mentioned. But because of their sin, the Lord has made them a reproach unto the nation and a mocking to all countries. So to be infamous, it means it has to have an exceedingly bad reputation. And they had an exceedingly bad reputation because they were idolizing other gods. They were doing things outside of the will of God. The nations round about examined um, Judah's behavior and saw their wickedness so that people would know that the exceedingly bad reputation was just so out of the will of God. And then as they go on and reading from verses 6 to 12, I like when it says, Behold, the princes of Israel, everyone according to his power, have been in thee to shed blood. Um, in thee have they set light by their father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the servants, and have they wronged the fatherless and the widow? So this right here, the wicked kings of Judah were also guilty of putting innocent men to death. You know, when you read over to uh, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 21, and verse 16, and verses 24 and 4, this also helps us to understand the wicked kings that also was going on in those days. So Judah was guilty of oppressing the travelers, having wronged the fatherless and the widow, despising the Lord's holy things, and having profaned his Sabbath. See, we don't have to worry about if God is looking. God is always looking. God is all-knowing, all-seeing. So those travelers that were oppressed, amen, they were defended at the end of the day because the Lord God saw how they wronged these fatherless and widows. Hallelujah. How they despised the Lord's holy things. And, and, and also profane his Sabbath day. Hallelujah. So that's why I said, you know, I love this passage of scripture because it identified those that God was exposing that was doing all of this negativity to these people that we sometimes look down at. You know, a lot of times when people maybe not be in our caliber or maybe people may not be in our clique or be in our crowd or look like us, we look down on them. We begin to wrong them. We begin to do all type of foul things against them. But one thing you must understand is that they are God's people. And when you are looking down on them and doing those things by rejecting them and wronging them because maybe they are fatherless or maybe because they are widows, you know God is looking at you. And he does not like that. Because his love is out for the fatherless. His love is out for those widows. So at the same thing, even when we, when we despise holy things, people may not be looking, but God is looking. So we need to get that out of our mind and quit fooling ourselves saying, well, the people can't see us. We're behind closed doors, but know that Jehovah can see us because he's I'm not present. I'm not listening. I'm not potent. All knowing, all seeing, being their God. So we need to keep his holy things sacred. We must continue to always bless his name and always honor him and give him the glory and reverence him and have fear of the Lord. See, God's people have become sexually immoral as well. They have taken women in her time of impurity, committed adultery with their neighbor's wives. Fathers have taken their daughters in laws and even their own daughters and insects. Brothers were defiling their sisters and God's people were defiled. They were lovers of money and would be doing immoral things to obtain more of it. So insect perversion just didn't start with us today. It went on years and years before um, through our forefathers. And because some of those generational curses was not broke 
it traveled through the bloodline. And now some of us have inherited that insect spirit or the spirit of perversion. So that's why we have to continue to pray, pray and break the back of the enemy in the spirit of perversion and the spirit of insect. Because this has been going on for generations and generations. But at the end of the day, it was un, it was impurity. It was it was so foul unto God. It was a foul and nasty spirit that had come and took place. And God Almighty was not pleased. They were lovers of their own money. They put money before God. They put their money before the things of God. They put money before their families. They put money before themselves. So they were lovers of their own money. They didn't care how they got it. They didn't care what they did with it. They didn't care who they stepped over. They didn't care who they hurt it or murdered. They just was out for the money. Isn't that what we see today in our generation? It's all about the dollar dollar bill. It's all about power, prestige, and fame. We need to be careful because we don't want to defile God through the love of our money, the love of buildings, the love of cars, the love of just people calling our name. Could we still sit in the place in the house of God if somebody don't call our name and still do the work of God and be faithful unto the things of God? Or do we need our name called? Do we need people to see us? Sometimes we need to just do things in secret. Sometimes we need to do things without our name being called. When I say do things in secret, I'm not talking about doing things in secret that is going to take us out of the will of God. But I'm talking about doing God's work. Sometimes we don't have to let people know what we're doing. Let's just do it. We don't have to let people know who we're blessing. Let's just bless them. That's why I pray that God give us the spirit of discernment even more kinder. So we can be able to discern the needs of God's people. It's nothing like showing up at someone's doorstep and being there to be a help. When they have prayed and toiled all night, not knowing when they would get their next meal, not knowing when they would get gas just to be able to go to work, or not knowing how they'll be able to survive in this pandemic. But because we have such a keen discernment, God has laid it on our hearts to be a blessing, to help those that are in need. That is what it's all about. Not to be lovers of our own money, but to take the money that God has blessed us with and be a blessing to those that may be in need. So, as we go on and reading from 13 to 16, Behold, therefore I have smitten my hand at the dishonest gain which they have made, and of the shy blood which have been in the midst of thee. So this right here talks about him smitting my hands, meaning together indicates the act of wrathful in the nation. Jehovah was enraged at the Judah's sinful state. The Lord asked the question, can their heart endure or can their hands be strong in the day that I shall deal with thee? See, Judah had become consequent and comfortable in their sin. They felt a sense of security that should not have been there. You know, when you read in the book of Jeremiah chapter 5 verses 30, you know, at the same time, Judah, they didn't care if God saw what they were doing. They were so complex and so comfortable in the sin that they were committing, they began to believe their own lie. They began to believe the lie was the truth. And that's what happens to us today. We get so deep in lies. We get so deep into Satan's um, deception that we begin to believe our own lie. And then it becomes a lie after lie. One little white lie turns into many lies. So that's why we have to be careful and make sure that we are dealing in the truth. So help us God. Because one little white lie can make us believe a whole full of, a handful of lies. But Judah, they were in such a sinful state. They didn't care what the Lord God saw them doing. They were so into their money. They were so into their sin. They were so into sleeping with their daughters and daughters-in-law. They didn't even care that it was family. They just, they just wanted. They, it was such a high sexual and moral to, um, spirit that was being um, released among them that it didn't even matter. Which you know that was truly a foul and nasty spirit that was being taken place. But at the same time, 
Judah compared to drows from the prince kings to the common people. See, God's people have become a drow silver. See, a drow silver, a dross of silver is the impurities of brass or tin or iron and lead that mix themselves with silver as an olive. The picture is of an unclean, impure person. That is what a dross of silver is representing here. The Lord will solve the problem by gathering all the dross to Jerusalem, meaning throwing them into the furnace, bringing a fire of war upon them. See, this was the siege of Jerusalem, and thereby met his people to separate the pure from the impure. When this would occur, Judah would know that, like he always say, I, Jehovah, have poured out my wrath upon you. And the word of God says, we in verse 23 to 25, And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, There are a land that is not cleansed, and nor rain upon the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, raving the prey. They have devoured souls. They take treasures and precious things. They have made her widows many in the midst thereof. We're taking a lot of God's precious people and misusing them. This is what this is talking of. How you're taking them as prey. A lot of times because of their vulnerability. You know, you got to be careful of telling people what you're going through. Because sometimes they take your vulnerability and use it against you. These are those people that had this vulnerability. They were innocent. They didn't know no better. So they used them and they began to take them. But see, what they didn't realize was that they were precious in God's eyes. They were like treasures in God's eyes. And God saw what they began to do with the people. So the princes and the kings, the people, and now prophets are respect as an object of God's indignation. God's indignation was against these prophets. Why? Because they were taking innocent blood. They were taking souls that were precious and turning them into outside of the will of God. The prophets had devoured souls. Hallelujah. We got to be careful even as men and women of God. When God entrusts us to look over his people and entrust us to look over the body of Christ, it's not saying that there are people but we must look over their souls by giving them and feeding them the word of God. By, by, by telling them about their sin and love and exposing their sin and love and telling them what's right by directing them to the word. Because it's the word of God that is going to deliver them. Yes, we sometimes even testify about the things that God has brought us out of. But if we constantly say, oh, I've been saved for 50 years and 100 years and don't have a testimony behind that, then how are they going to know we ever came out of something? Sometimes we use that, but what we don't know is we're hurting them because we don't testify and tell them how God has brought us out maybe our addiction or brought us out of our idolatry or brought us out of whatever it is that God has delivered us from. It's going to be hard for them to know that they can be saved or they can be delivered. So what we do is we beat them down and we talk about their sin and we and we judge them and, and, and we just um, do so many foul things against them and we make them feel less than and then now they're uh, then now they're um, um, operating in self pity and um, self rejection and then they don't feel no value or they feel like they feel like that they are part of the kingdom of God because of our judgment, but who are we to judge them? We're just supposed to expose their sin and love by directing them to the word of God and telling them right from wrong, but also helping them and pushing them into their purpose and destiny. But a lot of times we push them out and the prophets here, they were devouring their souls. They're taking treasures. They made widows in Judah by murdering women's husbands. Hallelujah. They, the, the greed for their riches moved them to an ungodly act against others. Hallelujah. That means that they begin to do all types of vile things. Hallelujah. Against each other. Glory to God. And the thing is, we have to be careful because these things causes God's wrath and indignation against us. So when you go on and reading on verse 26, 
it, it lets us know that the priests, those who represented the law of Jehovah, had done violence to the law. They represented by profaning Jehovah's holy things. These were men and women of God. These were the Levites. These were the priests, those that were supposed to um, take on holy things and, and protect them and, and hold them as treasures. But they were profiling, you know, they, they, they was um, defiling holy things. They were, were, were not even, um, um, proclaiming the Sabbath day, they were like out the will of God. They were doing their own thing. You know, it's like they were putting a branch up to their nose saying, okay, God can't see this, but we're doing everything outside of his will. And even though we're priests and we're supposed to be holy and righteous, but we're doing things the way we want because these sins that we're in, we're so deep in them. And guess what? We love the sin. So they didn't care about being seen. Which that was dangerous because they were looked at as priests, one of the high aspects in that area. Hallelujah. So they didn't even care about the holy things. See, to profane Jehovah's holy things is defined as not making a death uh, distinguish between the holy and the common. Neither have they caused men to discern between the unclean and the clean. Meaning they allow people to sin. They allow unclean and the clean to come together. They didn't separate it. They didn't separate the unholy and the holy. They allow it to mingle. It became like gangrene. It began to what? Um, anytime gangrene began to set in, it will affect everybody and everything. It's like rot apples. If you put one rot apple in the basket, guess what? When you wake up, or not even before you wake up, all the other apples are going to be rotten. Why? Because that one bad apple sparred and spread it through all the other good apples. And this is what they were doing. They were allowing unclean people to come into the things that were holy, sacred, clean. Amen. So therefore, this was something that was outside of the will of God. God, even today, you know, most of the time, we as men and women of God do not properly distinguish between doctrine, hallelujah, that is true or false. We believe in a lie. We believe in our own thoughts, our own intellect, our own knowledge, and sorry to say, our own wisdom. Because we don't went to college and we have our doctorate degrees. We don't wrote 50 books and we've been in the ministry for over 100 years. We have gotten away from the true doctrine, sound doctrine of the word of God. And that is dangerous. See, today we need to make sure that we are in the word of God. We must proclaim and be able to distinguish God's word from just many words of people that is not of God. So as we travel here through the book of Ezekiel, we're still in chapter 22 before we go ahead and study 23. I want to close out by saying that when we read in chapter 13 of Ezekiel, it revealed the fact that God was against false prophets who spoke lies as they claimed to speak divine revelation. The wickedness of the kings of Judah should have been stopped by the prophets. But however, rather than stopping or warning the kings, they comfort them in their era. Isn't that what's going on today? We're comforting people in their era. We're allowing error to overtake truth. We don't want to, we don't want to confront error because we don't want people to not like us. Or we don't want people to stop calling our name. But we must continue to point out error because when there's error, there is disobedience. When there is error, there is no sound doctrine. When there is error, it is not the will of God. So after we understand that these princes and priests and prophets, the Lord moves to his general population of Judah. See, God's people have vexed the poor and oppressed the traveling strangers. With the broad view of all of this, God's people is always God's people. And we have to be we have to be careful on how we do God's people. Because the law exclaims that there is not one righteous man to be found who can make intercession, intercession for such a simple people. 
his judgment therefore spoken of in the prophet perfect as though it had already occurred. See here we must understand that God's promise for his people will always stand. So that's why we should not mistreat God's people no matter if they're rich or poor, if they're big or small, if they're skinny or fat, or whatever case they may be, they are still God's people. So as we continue to stand in the gap in chapter 23, it reveals to us the whoredoms of Israel in Judah Review. The word of God in verses 1 in chapter 23, the word of Jehovah came again to me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they played the harlot in Egypt. They played the harlot in their youth. There their breasts pressed, and there were handled the bosom of their virginity. And the names of them were, um, excuse me, Ohola and the elder, and Oholaba, her sister. So here we talk about the, uh, the name Ohola is the greater sister, not elder. Because there were ten tribes that she excuse me that she occupied, the northern kingdom of Israel, with this capital being Samaria. The name Ola means her tent, the other sister. Now Oholaba represents the southern kingdom of Judah, with their two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, the capital city of Jerusalem. Excuse me, Jerusalem. The name. Jeholaba means my tent is in her. The idea of tent comes when the holy place of worship, hallelujah, we're talking about a holy place of worship, meaning the tabernacle. So that Israel name indicates her self-deluded with worship, her tent, as exposed to Judah, which stands as God's tent in her, right? So led away by other nations, they followed them in interest because of their power, their idolatry and culture. So as we have already had the reader read on in uh, chapter 23, verses 1-21, we know o, Ohola, meaning Israel, belonged the Jew, excuse me, belonged the Jehovah God in that the two had entered a covenant agreement, right? Dated on her lovers, the Assyrians. To do, excuse me, to do is to show excessive love or foulness, to be foolish or feeble minded as a result of excuse me, consistent liberty. See, Israel looked and admired the royal garments, minded as a result of their pleasure. See, again, as you look at and see that they were so admired by their warrior garments, their majesty of the kingdom, their maternity might, and was utterly love struck. She forgot her first love because she was shallow minded, looking to earthly glories. That's right. Sometimes we forget Jehovah, our Lord God, Jesus. We look at the things of this world instead of looking at the things of God, eternal life. And she was struck because she was into her warrior garments. She loved those things more than she loved God. So at the same time, she forgot her first love. That's right. See, being overwhelmed with the beauty and power of Erasia, Israel gave herself over to them. And the adultery giving them tribute of money. So when you read in, um, 2 Kings chapter 15 and chapter 16 and Hosea chapter 7 and 11. This will give you more insight of what we're talking about now. Because of time, we don't have time to go deep into that. That's why I said to make sure that you write down these parallel other scriptures so that you can go back and parallel everything together so that you get a revelation of God's word. So she defiled herself with idolatry. When the Lord saw that his bride was ripped for judgment because she would not repent, he delivered her over to her lovers. You know, God will deliver us over to the things that we love. And then we will say, God, where are you? But the thing is, God wanted us to repent inwardly. He wanted us to come back to him. We are his first love. How can 
we take the things of God after he has given to us and then love them more than him? You know, we love our jobs more than God. We love our houses and cars more than God. We even love our children, our wives, our husbands more than God. I'm not telling us not to love the, like our children, our husbands, our wives, but we need to love God first because it is God Almighty who is our everything. Everything else is second to God. And this is what happened. She began to love everything at, before God. She did not put God first. And then not only that, she would not even repent. So he said, okay, since you want to be a lover of your own money, you want to be a lover of all these other things, your royal garments and all this other royalty that I gave you, I'm going to hand you over to your enemy. So the, come on now, the Azrians took Israel captive and others they killed with the sword. So when you go on to read, Judah's sinfulness goes much deeper than that of Israel. Judah not only played the harlot with the Azrians, but with the Babylons as well. Rather than learning the lesson from watching Israel be destroyed, they followed her steps, even took extra steps of adultery. Hallelujah. See, the word paramour means a lover of either sex, one in an adulterous relationship. We know that God is life, and that sin separates a man from God. That's right, because when you travel over to Isaiah 53 and 1, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7. Please make sure you read these other scriptures in your time of leisure. So, not to that the Lord states of the relationship be, um, between both the sinful um, Israel and Judah, that they are alienated from him due to their sin. And as in the days when Israel worshipped the gods of Egyptians after coming out of Egypt, of Egypt so now God's people continue to turn to their own sin. So here, we understand that those who once practiced adultery with Judah will now come and destroy her. Like any foolish relationship is not built on integrity, sincerity, and truth, fall so the affair between Judah and Babylon. God is in control of everything that what we're reading in this book right now today. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 23, he was in control of everything. But one of the things that he proclaimed, I will commit the judgment to them. So throw out, we know that the major prophets would find that Babylon would be a battle axe. That's right. The rod of, co of correction and the sword would be against them. And that's why when you read verses 25 and 27 as we're closing out, and I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal with thee in fury. They shall take away thou nose and thou ears, and the residue shall fall by the sword. They shall take their sons and their daughters, and their residue shall be devoured by the fire. They shall also strip thee of the clothes, and take away their fair jewels. Thus will I make the lewdness to cease from thee, and the whoredom brought from the land of Egypt so that they shall not lift up their eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt no more. Jehovah is a jealous God. That's right. He was like a jealous husband. Who shall, meaning deal with his adultery wife and fury. See, the Babylonians, the battle act of Jehovah, will, would ill-treat the inhabitants of Judah by cutting off their nose and ears. This was a common practice of mutilating captive prisoners. See, truly God's wrath is unleashed. And after the fury of God's jealousy is outpoured upon Judah, he would, he would um, turn to the chattelings. That's right. And make diluted to cease. Meaning that this was a diluted state of Ju Judah. And was in no frame of mind to repent. So guess what? It says you're not in a frame of mind to repent. Come on. God will come for you. So come on. Read on. 28 through 35. Here we see the whole picture. Judah is distinct as a woman that is married to a man that has taken good care of her. Yet she turns her back on him when she sees that the grass is greener on the other side. Isn't that what happened to us? 
when we think that the grass is green on the other side, we done got our good jobs, we done got our husbands, our children, everything that we was praying for. We was on time with God, we was faithful with God, we was obedient to God, and once God gave us all these things, we just divorced him. We left him. We just been doing the doctor's things against him. This is what happened here. She is not willing to struggle with her husband or work through hard times. You know, we're not willing to work with God. We feel like if we don't get it right now, or if he don't answer us right now, is there really a true and living God? Oh, yeah. God is real. And he's definitely true. But he worked things out for our good. Not when we just need them. Not when we just want them. See, a lot of times we think this is like a microwave world. You know, you put something in, you get something out quick. But see, it's something that's called process. Process means that we got to go step by step, not just from A to Z, but you got to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, and Y, Z. But we don't want to go straight through the alphabet. We want to go from A to Z. That's not process. Let me tell you about process. Process means that you may go into the fiery furnace. You may go into the lion's den. The tsunami may even come and try to take you over. The earthquake may try to take you in. But at the end of the day, you shall survive. Because the process does nothing but make you. It allows you to become more into God. It, it also humbles you. It allows your, hum your humility to be even greater in God. And it brings your patience to another level in God. And it allows the truth of his spirit to overtake you. So that his joy, come on, and all the truths of his spirit will be your attributes. But we don't want to go through the process. We think the grass is greener on the other side. We think if we can jump from A to Z, or jump from the top of the step to the bottom of the step, we're going to make it down safely. But let me help somebody. You may break a leg. Because if you're trying to jump from the top to the bottom of the step, hey, then the steps may be too steep. Or you may get down to the bottom and figure, hey, your ankle is not good. So if I were you, I would just go step by step. Then you would make it down at the same time that you would have jumped from the top to the bottom. And you definitely can't jump all the other steps because you're going to miss a step. And that right there, too, is going to cause your ankle to maybe be hurt. So why don't you just go step by step? Because we think that the grass is good on the other side, just like she did. See, she's not willing to struggle. She's not willing to work hard. She's not willing to make things work out. She wanted to do it her way. So she didn't want to struggle with her husband and work through. She rather looked to the wealth and the splendors of others and turn her back upon the one that truly loved her. She forgets and casts behind their back the one who truly cares. See, Judah would drink the cup of violence and wrath that Israel drank. The state of intoxication and destruction would cause the nation to ridicule Judah. See, while Judah was proclaiming their innocence, the Lord proclaimed, filled with the desires of other nations, that they had no clue to what God's law said. The adultery they committed with idols proved that they placed the gods of Chedonites and other nations on a par with Jehovah God. So convinced were they that the gods of the other lands were true. They sacrificed their sons upon the altar of Malak. See, apparently the same day that they killed their sons to Malak, they went into Jehovah's sanctuary on the Sabbath and gave him worship. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you go give God worship after you don't sacrifice your sons to another God? See, that's what I'm saying. We have to go back and begin to pray and break generational curses because these are things that our forefathers and fathers have done. Hallelujah. And that's why we don't understand why we're going through some of the things we're going through. Sometimes, day after day, we try our best to try to get on the right road, but it seems like we keep going through that same revolving door. Why? We need to go back and repent. And ask God, is there anything in our past or anything in our lineage that please forgive us 
so that we won't continue to commit and make these same sins, these same sins that they did. See, apparently, they knew that what they did was not of God. How dare you go and worship knowing that you were serving another God? How dare you go and put your right up to your nose knowing that what you have done is not holy, is not clean, but is impure. It is um, unholy and it's out of the will of God. See, these are these things that were happening are likely that Isaiah revealed in chapter 39. So I need you to go to the book of Isaiah in chapter 39 and read that whole chapter because these were things that even Isaiah revealed. Even Hezekiah had sent messengers to Babylon. The Babylon princes came and saw all of Judah's treasures. Isaiah rebuked Hezekiah for doing this and told him that the Babylonians will eventually come and take all their treasures away. See, the prophet Isaiah was not scared to speak, thus said the Lord God. He spoke it. And whatever he spoke, it happened. So the blood that lies in the hands of the adulterers of the old Hole and the old Hole were both the souls and the bodies of innocent men and women. With their false teachers, they seduced Judah and Israel. And with their murder, they killed the innocent. But when Judah is destroyed for her spiritual adultery, she will know that Jehovah is the Lord who proclaims the end before the beginning. So let me end this in saying that we are praying that God deliver us from any spiritual adultery that have come against us in the mighty name of Jesus. Because Judah, Judah, will be destroyed for her spiritual adultery. That's right. See, Judah would be taken captive. They would be robbed and stoned and killed with swords. And their houses would be burnt with fire. See, the reason why this punishment was given is because it needed to stop the low and adulterous behavior. The behavior was adulterous. It was not of God. And God was sick and tired of this adulterous behavior. So, in closing, the Lord gives name to the two sister nations that committed adultery against him, that we just read. Ohola and Oholaba. That's right. So, Ohola was Israel and Samaria, and Oholaba was Jerusalem and Judah. Both of these sisters committed adultery with the Azariah and Egypt. The younger, Oholaba, went further and committed adultery with Babylon. So they didn't learn. They continued in their sin. Y'all on today, we are praying that we do not continue in any sin of spiritual adultery. That means that we're, we're, we're offering up idols of other gods. We're unholy and impure on God's Sabbath. Meaning that we are we are doing things outside of the will of God. We're worshiping other gods. We should never worship any other gods. We should definitely not worship money because that is a God. When you begin to worship your money, you is worshiping another God. And that is not your true and living God. Only Jehovah, Jesus Christ, is our God. So we need to make sure that we're lifting him up, that we're honoring Jesus, that we're making Jesus our front and center, that we're making Jesus our one and only, that we're making Jesus who we're running after. It's Jesus Christ that is our husband, that is our first love, and nothing or nobody can come in between him because he is our first. So we thank you for joining us, and we welcome everybody. God bless you too, Sister LaShonda, and everybody that has joined us today. This is day 20 of 31 days in the book of Ezekiel. Lady Apostle Robbie Stokes prophetically speaking in God's word and his presence and his power and prayer for divine nation. 
We thank God for Sword the Bill to Redeem Radio TV Satellite Broadcasting Services. That is satellite over 256 other countries. We're glad that you're here on our social media platform. And again, we thank God for your life and we thank God for you joining us. Follow us Facebook Live and also on YouTube. Hallelujah. Again, we thank Lady Apostle Robin Stokes for teaching us the Word of God on this morning. And as we leave you, we want you to understand that we can't obey God's word until we first listen to his word. And again, we welcome you and we're glad that you were here. Thank God for your life. And don't forget to follow us. That's right. YouTube, I Heart, Facebook Live. Amen and glory to God. Hallelujah. And thank you for joining us on our Sunday services, Sword International Network, Word on the Go, Let's Go. And again, we thank you. His faithfulness is our shield. So we wrap Psalms 91 around you, and we bless you. And we know that you're going to have a great weekend. So by God's grace, join us on tomorrow as we travel in the book of Ezekiel chapter 24 and 25. May God bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen and glory to God. Thank you.